All right. So, um, oops, I have a slide. I have a few slideshows. So I'll start the slideshow and then uh, and then we'll kick us off. Where's the slideshow button? There we go. All right. Yeah. So this is the name of the training today. Um, hope folks are in the right place. Uh, but if you're not, you're free to stick around and hang out and learn about uh, electoral endorsement processes in DSA chapters. Um, and we're kind of framing this as a what's worked and what we've learned in the course of um, my and Nick's experience in our own chapters. And we'll go over a little bit about what that entails in a second. Um, but yeah, I'll just put it out there right now that this is not sort of a one size fits all, you know, requirement standard endorsement process for every DSA chapter across the US. This is um, kind of a best practices presentation based on what's worked and what we've learned. All right, so I will move forward. Um, so we have an introduction here or an agenda here. We'll start with some introductions. It looks like we have a lot of folks on the call. So probably do introductions in the chat. Um, and then some DSA versus non-DSA endorsements, uh, the case studies as a part of what's worked and what we've learned from Metro DC and Louisville. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about what a sample endorsement process could look like. Um, then we'll touch a bit on transitioning from endorsements to campaigning. As, as I'm sure a lot of folks here know, it does not happen magically. Um, it takes, takes a lot of work to, to move from one to the other. And then finally, um, we'll go into some political trade-offs. Not a lot of um, political trade-offs and discussion, but um, we did want to put those out there just as something to consider. In this uh, training, we will really focus on the, the endorsement process. Um, but yeah, at the end, we'll have some room for some, you know, trade-offs you have to make while you're making endorsements as a chapter, as an individual, as maybe an electoral committee. And then also, um, yeah, we want to hear what, what you all think over the course of the presentation. So I've talked a lot as we've gotten started. So I'll hand it over to uh, Nick to introduce himself first and then and then I'll go. And then um, we have some questions for you all to put some answers in the chat as well. So Nick, take it away. Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Nick. Uh, I use he, him pronouns. Uh, I'm in Louisville DSA, uh, which is in Kentucky. Uh, uh, my current role in the chapter is I'm the electoral committee chair. Uh, I've been pretty active in our chapter's electoral work uh, for the last three cycles, 2018, 2020, uh, and now 2022. Uh, and I would say that the, the most memorable campaign I've ever worked on uh, was one that we just wrapped up recently. I was a cam campaign manager for Tyler Lehman. Uh, who's a, a very close friend of mine, a uh, longtime DSA comrade, who uh, uh, stuck his neck out there, ran for Metro Council in a district that uh, we couldn't couldn't find someone to run for. Um, and we, we gave it a lot of effort. Uh, we had zero name recognition uh, and came within 51 votes of winning. So uh, uh, largely that was uh, uh, formed through a, a very extensive door knocking operation. So. Uh, we didn't win, but you know, perhaps we built our chapter with it. Uh, I guess time will tell. But uh, it was it was a heck of a campaign to work on. So I, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't I wouldn't not do it again. I would always do it again. Uh, it was it was great. All right, thanks, Nick. Um, yeah, we have a bit at at the very end about when to sort of run campaigns to win, which it sounds like it, know, Louisville, Louisville definitely did. In 51 votes of winning, that's definitely winning to win. But also for capacity building, sometimes we just got to get out there, take a chance, um, and run to build that capacity, just kind of work those electoral and campaign muscles. Um, as for me, I'm from the Metro DC chapter, so we cover uh, the District of Columbia, also Virginia and Maryland. Um, I've been the chair of our steering committee, and I was our electoral committee equivalent chair as well. Um, for the cycles there, I started in 2010 as a field organizer for a campaign in, in Virginia, um, where I learned some distributed organizing and then kind of got out the game for a little while. Trump won, I joined DSA. Um, yeah, I got back into it. And I've been involved, I think, pretty much every cycle since that. Um, and my most memorable campaign was um, we supported a, 
a candidate named Janice Lewis George, and she won a seat on the DC Council. It was a hard fought race. Um, she ran uh, as part of her platform on you know, divesting from police, reinvesting in community, and she still won. Um, they, got, they attacked her for it viciously, still won. It was a uh, very, very good feeling. And then for you all, if you could put, um, respond in the chat with these uh, with answers to these questions or some of these questions or most of these questions, that would be great because um, that'll give Nick and I an idea of what to really kind of focus on in our slides and in our responses and sort of, and how we, um, how we facilitate the team. Yeah, well, everyone's typing. We should be just about an hour tonight. Um, and Nick, what, what did we end up with in terms of slides? Probably like 20 or so slides of content, but decent amount of discussion slides as well. All right, we're getting some responses. Um, excellent. All right. West Virginia, Milwaukee, Inland Empire. Cadre versus outside candidate endorsements. That's something that we still struggle with in, in Metro DC. And we've been endorsing candidates for five years. Um, all right. Current city council campaign. Excellent. Oh, wow. All right, Dennis, you ran for city council in LA. Very cool. Okay. Yeah, Bernie 2020. That was, that was, um, that was definitely memorable. <laughs> um, all right, minimal electoral experience, that's okay. Marshall, we'll, we'll start from sort of the basics here, we'll start from the found, foundations. Um, Tampa, all right. Yep. Um, you can use, yeah, Alec, you can use electoral to generate just buzz and hype in the chapter and to develop new cadre we definitely it's definitely happened in our chapter people have started in electoral campaigns and then they've they've done one cycle and kind of never showed you know never been to it or not never been to another camp since but they still go to camps every now and then um but they do their own stuff labor kind of organizing what have you nick had did you notice that at all in um for this recent cycle where, where you got people joining the electoral work who you'd never really seen before A little bit, yeah. Um, you know, there there are definitely people who sort of, you know, were maybe on the fringes of DSA who only sort of got involved uh, because of electoral work. Um, most of our active volunteers for the for the Lehman campaign were pretty core uh, DSA members, um, which was great. We have the, we 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 we've, we've been building our canvassing operation specifically for several years for this kind of reason. So uh, we sort of cash some of that in with, you know, door knocking pros. Um, but yeah, you know, we had people who, you know, sort of, you know, just signed up, found out there was a DSA candidate running in their district and they're like, hey, I, I wanna go, I wanna, I wanna go help this guy that's knocking doors in my neighborhood. Um, so that was definitely, that was a definitely thing that happened a few times. Yeah. No, it's, it's um, an electoral campaign can be sort of one tool in the toolbox for how, for how we sort of activate members in our chapters, fellow members, cadre members, uh, less active members alike. Um, all right, well, thanks folks for putting everything in the chat, all the introductions. Um, excellent, all right. So let's uh, get into it. 
and I will turn it over to Nick for this section. And Nick, if you want to just give me the next slide, uh, cue. I'll do that. Yeah. Uh, hey everyone. Uh, so apologies. Uh, at first, there is I'm I'm in the Louisville DSA office space that we share with other groups. Um, there is some horrible noise going on in the background. I don't know if it comes through with you all. I don't know what it is, but it's very annoying to me. Uh, and hopefully it's not too annoying to you. But uh, anyway, uh, so yeah, I wanted to talk about specifically what distinguishes a DSA endorsement from an endorsement that you might see from any organization, right? Uh, if you're like me, you probably get something in the mail from some nonprofit right before election day that has you know, a listed endorsement for every single race that's on the ballot. Uh, DSA chapters don't tend to do that. So what's the difference there? And that's, that's what I wanna get into. Um, so, you know, the first thing is that we as, as, as DSA chapters uh, in an ideal have uh, a, a transparent democratic process that uh, comes from our chapter priorities, uh, is something that our members have buy into um, and, and, and also has results that will respond to future organizing. So you wanna endorse people who your members are excited about um, you're going to endorse people who advance your chapter's other work, not just uh, to win an election. Um, and then also people that you think uh, will be responsive to your future work, right? You know, if you, uh, for example, like our chapter, we really want, um, you know, public ownership of our, our electrical company. Uh, uh, we, we, you know, we've been fighting for that. So if we endorse someone that's running for office, uh, we want to make sure that, you know, when we come back in a year and, 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 and you know, have knocked on all the doors in their district and, and everything, that they're going to be with us on that kind of fight whenever there's a legislative fight. Um, also, DSA endorsements in comparison to perhaps other nonprofit type organizations are usually strategic uh, in a way that allows us to gauge capacity and decisions. Um, and it comes from this allocation of resources. Uh, and the reason for that is that we we back our, our, our endorsements up, right? Whenever you get an endorsement from DSA, it means you have boots on the ground. You have people knocking doors. You have people that are you know, taking time out of their lives uh, to volunteer for candidates. Um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of organizations just sort of endorse on paper. They don't, uh, they don't, they don't do um, that kind of commitment whenever they uh, put their name behind a candidate. Uh, we want our, our endorsements to be valuable uh, to, to candidates, that, that whenever you get the DSA endorsement, you know that's what's going to mean um, success for your campaign. So this has a couple effects. One um, is that you know, we want our people to win, right? You know, if you've got a chapter member that you have been working alongside for years, when it's time for them to run for office, you want to make sure that you know having the chapter behind them is meaningful and they don't just float away to whatever actually can provide the infrastructure that is 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 going to to push them over the line to win you know if you you know you can be a very committed socialist but if if if, if the socialists in town you know are going to knock 100 doors and you know raise 50 dollars for you when you go to run for office uh your options are either to lose or to go find more benefactors. Uh, we don't want people to go find more benefactors because usually those benefactors are bad. We don't want them to go and take money from you know, horrible uh, you know, developers and people like that. We want them to think that you know, DSA is enough. The DSA is enough to get them elected. It's enough to hold them accountable. And it's enough to, to make sure that they uh, follow through on the promises that they make in, uh, in a campaign. So what you get out of a DSA endorsement, you know, you get dozens of volunteers, you get people from all over the country donating five, 10, $27 at a time. Uh, you get policy help, you get people who, you know, for example, I was a campaign manager on a campaign, you know, I, I didn't have to be paid for that, right? I just did it because I really believe in the work and I just wanted to, to, to make sure that we won. Um, you know, that's the kind of thing that you don't, you know, you don't, you don't, you, you can't replicate that in you know, the democratic establishment or whatever um, without having a lot of resources um, uh, behind you uh, and, and my resources, I mean money. Um, so yeah, we, we, we want that to be different. Um, so on the, on the next slide, I have a little bit um, about what other organizations, how they kind of approach it, right? 
what, what, what we in our chapter in Louisville call the paper endorsement. I'm sure this is a phrase that other people use, but we, we use it a lot. Uh, uh, and these are endorsements that happen despite there being no ability to actually contribute or contest in a competitive way. Uh, and what I mean by that is a lot of times you'll see people who endorse just because there's this, this pressure to endorse whoever the best option is in every single race. So there could be two, two terrible Democrats running for state legislature and nonprofit will blunder in and just be like, well, we've picked one. Uh, and the idea is it's like based on, on, on access, right? You know, there's this idea that, you know, oh, well, we, we supported them. So whenever we go to lobby next year for whatever legislative priority that we want, um, they will um, respond in kind. Uh, that's not the kind of model that we want, right? That's not like, you know, that's not a, a, a workers movement party surrogate, whatever you want to call the thing. That's not the kind of thing uh, that we're trying to build with DSA. We're trying to build uh, uh, an electoral apparatus where where the, the people that, that win uh, with our, our support, um, you know, do so and, and remain within our orbit. And actually, you know, we're the, we're, we're the people that brought them there. Um, and it, it really weakens accountability, right? You know, if you if you endorse any caller that comes along, but you don't back it up in any way, right? You don't provide boots on the ground. You don't provide money. You don't provide all the things that come with having a DSA campaign uh, uh, in a lot of chapters. Um, you don't you don't actually have anything to hold over someone once they get in office. They can become elected. Um, but you didn't really bring anything to them. And so when someone else comes along and is like, well, we need you to vote this way on a bill, we can, we can make our calls and, and, and do our protests and so on and ask them to vote our way. But uh, if they make a calculation that losing our support doesn't actually lose them anything materially when it comes time for reelection, um, then they're not gonna be accountable to us. So uh, uh, it's very important that you're, 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 you're you're backing up your endorsements with something um, that reminds people and is valuable to people, um, because if it if, if it doesn't, they're just going to float away from you. Um, so for next slide, uh, yes, is a, in big bold letters, endorsement is a commitment. Like it is, it is not just your stamp of approval. It is tangibly. A commitment of resources. It is, it is hours of time. It is it is money, honestly, in DSA. You know, in our chapter, we're not allowed to donate directly from the chapter funds because that's illegal in Kentucky. But you know, chapter members individually, you know, I don't I don't donate five hundred dollars to a candidate if they're not backed by Louisville DSA. You know. Um, you know, and I don't do that a whole heck of a lot anyway. But you know, you know, if you're if you're not endorsed by DSA, it's zero dollars. You know, and 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 the difference for 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 most of our members, hopefully, is you know either zero dollars or whatever you can give. Um, you know, um, and 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 so you know, you we we want our we want our endorsement to to mean something is coming for you. Also, there is no one size fits all endorsement process. Um, so what you know what we have found works in Louisville has been sort of hard, hard learned lessons over three electoral cycles, and we'll probably refine it even more because we're we're just coming out of a cycle. Um, you know, the guidelines here are are the same. I think for any chapter, right? You know, you want to make sure that you have meaningful endorsements um, because if you don't. You know all the all the stuff that we're going to suggest you go through for endorsement process is a waste of time, but um, exactly what that looks like, right, is not going to be the same in every chapter. You know, if 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 an endorsement in Louisville DSA means you know forty hours of volunteer time or whatever, that's a number I've just pulled out of nowhere. But uh, if it means that for our chapter, in other chapters. Maybe that's beyond your capacity, or maybe it's a drop in the bucket and doesn't mean anything at all. Um, and so, uh, you you need to be you need to be assessing what your chapter can realistically provide, and develop endorsement processes that allow you to allocate that sort of institutional resource the most uh, the most efficiently. 
um, which sounds sounds very much like corporate speak, but you know it's <laughs> uh, it's it, 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 it's it, it's a general principle here. And I think we had one person on stack too. So, yes. um, Arthur, do you want to go, uh, and then we'll take a couple of stacks on this on this discussion point. Oh, right, there's a way. All right, no problem. Um, well, Arthur, if you come back and you want to jump back in, let us know. But um, yeah, have uh, you all, does anybody want to get on stack and talk about any differences that you've seen in your areas, any specific differences or just general differences that you've seen in, in your own chapters or geographies um, between DSA and non-DSA endorsements? All right, yeah, Sky, go ahead. Yeah, uh, for us here in Denver, the biggest thing is we're, I don't know, even in a lot of other progressive organizations in the area, the the endorsement decision is made by a, a small group of people, still like an elected group of people, but more like a, a board or a committee, whereas we try to do, I mean, that's our, that's our whole mandate. You can't be endorsed without having the support of the full membership. Yeah, that's um, I'd say that's pretty universal. A lot of a lot of organizations just have an executive board, sometimes not even elected, um, but the executive board will just make the call, um, and we'll talk about why that that might not be so great for providing those material resources that Nick's, Nick alluded to. Uh, and then Mikhail, I hope I pronounced that right. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, you pronounced it correctly, and I just wanted okay. to say that. Uh, uh, one organization in my local DSA chapter is uh, very small and doesn't really do much at this point in time. And we're trying to work on building it up. Uh, so we haven't really been able to do any electoral work. But one organization that I think deserves credit for working with a similar model, especially in our area, is the Working Families Party as well as a more West Virginia centric one, uh, West Virginia can't wait. Both of them have the same thing where it's people are coming together and writing the platforms. And then uh, when they endorse candidates, it comes with that canvassing and, uh, and door knocking and phone banking and et cetera. And I think that really builds accountability with elected officials and the fact that other organizations are noticing that and taking that model as well is a good sign. Yeah, yeah, it seems like other organizations are, are taking notes from, from us and seeing the kind of campaigns we can build because of this sort of democratic input and, <clears throat> and transparency. Um, and then Arthur, I know uh, you were on stack, so um, I'll grab your stack, but we'll probably just want to um, stick to stacks in the chat, and then Nick, maybe you and I can respond to the stacks as we're as we're going along. But Arthur, go ahead. Cool, thank you. Uh, yeah, Arthur Edmund, he, him, they, them. Uh, very active member of the electoral working group in Milwaukee DSA. Uh, I also am Ryan Clancy's campaign manager. Ryan Clancy. Just got elected for his second term on the county board of supervisors in, here in milwaukee county and we also successfully uh won another election on a slate that we had for that so it's great because we have a socialist caucus on the county board um and one thing that has been great about working with ryan is that he comes to pretty much every electoral working group meeting as well as almost every abolition working group meeting and we actually have a scenario now where folks in the abolition working group are writing resolutions for Ryan to introduce to the county board, which is just, I mean, that to me is like what we're fighting for, right? Like people writing legislation. Um, but there's definitely, like if we had more resources for that and know-how, you know, we would definitely be able to utilize that. So my question is, is as DSA continues to get these successes around the country, 
do you guys think that national DSA is interested in maybe putting resources behind legislation writing, you know, because you, you have to, you know, it's, it's a lay person can't exactly start writing legislation without like knowing how to do that and stuff like that. So I'm just wondering, is national or any area in DSA interested in, in supporting that in local chapters? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I can, uh, Nick, do you, want, do you want to take that? I can give my take. Yeah, that. so I have, a, I have a little bit of a policy background personally, just like from, from past professional lives uh, and so on. Um, and that's something that like we were really excited about the prospect of doing that, right? You know, we, you know, like, oh my God, we can have a council office and, you know, a legislative aide that would, you know, that would be their full-time job and they could, you know, sit down with a, a group of, of, you know, we, we dubbed it the DSA policy shop, but in a lot of ways it was just sort of informal, right? Um, uh, yeah, I think that's something that, 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 you know, I would like to, I would personally, this is me just speaking as an individual, would like to see us uh, have some infrastructure from that. I will say that the Green New Deal campaign committee does have a policy research team of people who, um, Provide, provided some assistance to the layman campaign um, uh, uh, with, with platform and things like that. Um, and so that might be a potential avenue, um, but that's just one part of DSA, you know, in a national structure. And so um, uh, I don't know what the national, for example, abolition working group looks like. Uh, I, I assume there is one, uh, but perhaps that's something that these national bodies could be able to do uh, over the long term, but yeah, I, I think I think I think just based on what I know about the legislative process, it's very important that at some point we learn those skills um, because, yeah, the the you know the NEC that's the kind of thing that I would like to see the NEC do. I don't we don't currently have a subcommittee for that, but uh, if you wanted to write up a proposal for us to do something along those lines, uh, I'm sure we would we would be very interested in uh, discussing what what's in our capacity to do. Yeah, I mean, the right, the right wing has been doing this for decades, right? Um, and, and it seems like that's something we should really get into is we can devote time and resources to that. And yeah, um, Arthur, that's like Nick said, that's something that we can take up with the NEC. I'd also be happy to help on any kind of proposal or something like that um, for some kind of policy advising body shop what have you. All right, um, and yeah, from now on, let's um, do stacks in the chat because Nick and I are gonna alternate. So um, either Nick or me can respond. Um, all right, and so now we have sort of a lessons learned case study section. It's gonna be pretty brief, um, but for Louisville or for Metro DC and Louisville, I think it's kind of reversed in that order. Yeah, so I'll toss it over to Nick for this one. Uh, yeah, so you know the case study uh, for for local DSA is you know we 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 started our chapter um, sort of end of 2016 early 2017 didn't really know what we were doing our first meeting was around a ping pong table um, nice ping pong table though uh, you know 2018 cycle comes around and we sort of just endorsed on like a case by case basis you know. A member would be like, I'm running for Congress or I'm running for mayor. And we'd just be like, that sounds great. And we'd, you know, endorse, you know, and then we'd be, you know, out knocking doors, you know, that was like a drop in the bucket for a congressional race, you know, and, you know, and, you know all of our candidates got cream. None of them got even close. Uh, and sort of out of that cycle, uh, we implemented a questionnaire because we were like, we got to have some way to filter out, uh, every, you know, people that ask, you know, we were starting to get a lot of inquiries from people. Uh, including people who weren't even remotely socialists, and so we were just like, okay, you know, we 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 have to we have to have a questionnaire that will help us evaluate campaigns based on. Um, mainly at the time, it was mostly policies. We we wanted to make sure that we were endorsing people who were aligned with our our our, our you know beliefs, um, but also you know as time went along, we refined that questionnaire to include questions of viability. Uh, you know, for example, you know. Uh, if I were to run for Congress, for example, should the chapter endorse me? Well, no, like I'm just like a schlub that works in a library and I'd lose by a lot. 
and like that would be a huge waste of time um you know maybe i'm like you know the best you know socialist on earth or whatever but and i'm not but you know if, if i were you know uh but that doesn't matter because like you know it'd be just a total waste of our chapter's resources and they, they, they would be foolish to endorse me but you know uh as someone comes along and they're really rooted in their community and they have great socialist politics and they've been helping build our chapter for years and they you know are very charismatic and, and able to knock doors like a, like a champion and they're like i want to run for state legislature and you know we have you know this many dsa members in that state legislative de <laughs> district uh those are the kind of measurements that we want to be like oh okay so there's a difference between these campaigns one of these um is is winnable uh, it's one that we can actually come up with a plan and 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 actually be successful with it, uh, and we can uh, build our chapter with it because we know, based on uh, you know various uh, 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 factors, based on maybe previous votes and previous elections and so on and so forth, uh, that that would be a good place to run. And so we we built on that over the course of three cycles, and now in the current cycle, what we do is is we try to train people who are very active in our chapter to actually run for office we we started this like whole academy where we train people that run or are interested in running uh and and then we also train people who are interested in running campaigns or working on campaigns or doing comms for campaigns or whatever uh and so we we, we end up with this sort of regimented process where uh the electoral uh committee uh uses the questionnaire and interview to gather information and it's open to where you don't have to have gone through all of our trainings to, to apply for endorsement. You don't even really technically have to be a member to apply for endorsement. Although I would be hard pressed to think that our chapter would probably endorse someone at this stage that was not a member, but I will not speak on behalf of my 450 comrades. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, the electoral committee uses the process to gather information uh, through a questionnaire, through an interview, you know, you just sit down, ask a, a steady stream of questions for an hour for 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 someone, uh, and and figure out, you know, what do they believe? You know, are they a socialist? Uh, what is this campaign going to look like? Is it a campaign that is going to uh, build the power of our chapter? Is it going to help uh, working people organize? Is it going to create more socialists? Is it going to cause people to actually? learn about socialism and develop class consciousness and then move into action, win or lose the election. Um, those are the kind of questions that we have to ask and the electoral committee then, you know, brings it back to the membership and says, okay, this is all the information that we gained. Now it's up to you to debate and decide. There's always an opportunity for a Q&A with a candidate uh, at our general meetings, but we always do our endorsements at a general meeting because that's where most of our members um, uh, are gonna be you know, at. Uh, some chapters do it differently. Some chapters do like uh, email votes and things like that. That's totally fine, whatever works for your chapter. But in our in our, our chapter, the process is that, you know, Canada comes and answer questions, the electoral committee presents whatever information they gained. Um, and then the membership sits down and debates it. And, you know, we've had, you know, we've had intense debates over the years over whether or not to endorse a candidate, you know, uh, I'll never forget one time we had a debate where someone got up and said, you know, we must not endorse this candidate. And they quoted Lenin and said why we wouldn't endorse the candidate. And then someone got up on the other side of the room. And they said, we must endorse this candidate. And they quoted Trotsky. And uh, a media member came to report and was very confused. Um, but, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, but it's important to have that kind of debate and tease those questions out because we're not a monolithic organization. Um, we are a democratic organization. We're an organization that that um, our collective decision making springs through um, the ability to hash out our differences amongst one another in a com in a comradely way, and and it, it strengthens our chapter. So, uh, but yeah, that's all I that's all I, I, I have for that. Well, I won't add too much to that. I think Nick actually touched on a lot of what. Um, I was going to say, at least in, in a strategic sense, um, in terms of kind of, you know, why we have debates and how we have debates and how we structure those debates. Um, yeah, I think our, our chapter in D.C. has um, moved through a lot of the similar steps as Louisville. And you kind of see 
those steps here. Um, and I'll briefly go over each of these sort of, I, I would say, phases of our of Metro DC's electoral program um, in 2017 to 2018. That's when we were kind of like Louisville, just sort of getting into it, uh, into the swing of things, sort of back into it for some comrades in the chapter. But um, where a lot of new people joined up in 2016, and we really sort of um, re-jumpstarted, re I want to say. It had already been going for a little while, but sort of jumpstarted the electoral program. Um, and we targeted specific races, but there was a lot of ad hoc vetting. Uh, vetting. There was passive recruitment of candidates in that we just kind of waited for candidates to come to us in, in targeted races. So we target districts and say, okay, there's a good person running. Let's see if they want the endorsement. Um, and then uh, by 2019 and 2020, we got to a point where our steering committee in our chapter, which is our leadership committee, had drafted and approved a standard questionnaire. Because before we were using different questionnaires for different cases. Um, there was actually no requirement to get a chapter endorsement other than two thirds of members had to endorse a candidate. So in 2019 to 2020, we had a questionnaire, we had a requirement um, that I think, and I think that was it. It was questionnaire and two thirds endorsement. Everything else was decentralized. At first, everyone thought, okay, this would be okay. You know, chapter members can take it on themselves to do vetting and then present it to the chapter and then we vote on endorsement. But what happened was it became very um, kind of opaque to chapter members. The chapter members would see one person do a whole bunch of Q&A sessions or conference calls or meet and greets or what have you. Um, and then they would go to the steering committee and they say, okay, I need you to help me do this. And the steering committee would say, it's actually, it was actually in our bylaw the steering committee would not really coordinate endorsements. So by 2021, 2022, we got to a point where we said, all right, there has to be some kind of accountability of the chapter's elected leadership to help facilitate this process. You know, chapter elected leadership doesn't need to help endorse a candidate who those individually elected members don't want to endorse. But at the same time, um, we reached a point where we said in our chapter, okay, there has to be some kind of accountability in terms of just helping people navigate what can be a very somewhat, I shouldn't say very, somewhat confusing process, especially for folks who are new to sort of the internal democratic structures that we have in DSA and in chapters across the country. Um, and we did have help from our political engagement committee in 2021 to 2022, um, which is a new committee we set up composed of um, steering committee elected members in our chapter and non-elected members um, who were appointed to the uh, political engagement committee. And I think that helped out a lot. It helped really sort of break down some of the silos in our chapter so that um, elected leaders and non-elected leaders felt very empowered to help navigate that process. All right, and we'll have, we have time for um, probably a couple stacks, but we got to keep it a little brief now. We'll go, I'm guessing, about five to 10 minutes over for the training, just because we started a little bit late. Um, but yeah, we can take like one or two stacks. Let's, let's actually, in the interest of time, probably just take one. So is, and can anybody um, talk about anything you would have done differently in your chapter's previous endorsement process? Because like Nick and I said, our chapters went through multiple phases. It was a learning experience. We built power, changed our endorsement processes, built capacity, changed our endorsement processes more. And we were able to, I guess, ask more of candidates and members alike to go through these steps. So yeah, Anthony, you're on staff. Um, yeah, so in hindsight for like our chapter for uh, Inland Empire you say like, I think like our electoral working group, um, it, it's, it needs to be like a little bit more transparent and open on like how you can participate in that. Um, right now, it seems like kind of like a closed door group. Um, and then we also don't have enough. And why that's a problem though, is because we don't have enough. We really haven't sat down as a chapter and said like, what are our priorities? So it's, we, we can't really like line up like candidates with priorities. And then when we go to vote, it's like what it, people are, it's, it's just kind of chaos. And it, uh, it, that's kind of like, been a big deal in our chapter lately, or especially now, it's yeah, it's not good. Yeah, and we had to go through that in our chapter um, until really 
the end of 2020 to 2021, that winter, um, we started voting on priorities in our county. And it, it kind of took us a while to get to that point. But I think by then, after the 2017 um, through 2020, through all those cycles and through just I don't know, struggle and other campaigns, um, yeah, it got to the point where people were like, okay, we need to, we need to vote on chapter priorities. Um, and the chapter priorities definitely inform how we constructed our questionnaire and how we engage politically with sort of like external actors, candidates being um, just some of those actors. Um, yeah, Nick, we'll take uh, one more, you one more stack and then we'll, we'll keep moving on. We'll probably speed it up a little bit after this too. Hey there, uh, just real quick. Um, so I think our chapter has kind of had to like restart a little bit. So we are kind of in the process of going through that, like, how do we do, uh, you know, how, how do we do endorsements and stuff like that? Uh, initially, just because of our capacity, we were thinking, uh, and I'm glad that we kind of got away from this is maybe we don't want to endorse. Um, there's a couple, we're in Vermont. Um, there's actually a pretty good amount of like left leaning progressives that are um, are like, and are sympathetic with a lot of our like viewpoints. Um, no one's really like openly like socialist though. Um, and uh, I think we've been talking about having, you know, we don't want candidates to renege. We don't want to go out and endorse someone and then have them say something that we don't like agree with, um, stuff like that. Um, but we've recently, I think kind of, uh, we invited, we got lucky because uh, a lot of representatives uh, actually that we met through like um, uh, like protests, stuff like that, they want to attend our meetings. So we have them at our meetings, let them talk to some of our members. Uh, we kind of question them. Um, and through that, we've actually discovered a couple of people that we have invited. Not only they want the endorsement, but they actually do have like some socialist values uh, that we appreciate. Um, so that was something that I think hopefully going forward is a, is a pretty good idea of talking with candidates, seeing if you can get them like at like your place of meeting. I mean, that's like pretty cool. I'm trying to like sell you on stuff, but um, you know, they, they, they got to do the thing, you do your thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, those sort of like pre-meetings um, can be pretty useful. Uh, we just started doing them in our chapter in like 2019 for the 2020 cycle. Um, and they can really help you level set with candidates to see where they are. And sometimes you can get them. Sometimes you can get them just like join DSA and run a socialist if they're really interested. Sometimes you got to push them a little bit. But, um, oftentimes it, it just takes that conversation to see where they're at and where you're at. Um, and then let's see, uh, for Matthew and Sky, we'll have to move on in the training. But if you want to toss your comments in the in the chat, um, either Nick or I will get to them. I'm saying Nick or I because I'm not sure who's going next. Um, Nick, do you want me to take this one or do you want to take this one? Um, I think I think you did this one. Yeah, I think I did this one. Yeah. Yeah, go for it. So yeah, we we outlined sort of a sample endorsement process. Um, so there are a few best practices I think chapters can draw from. One is that you're going to want um, consistent procedures and timelines. Um, the process that one candidate goes through should probably be the process all the candidates go through. And the reason for that is just that you, if you don't have rules, you will find ways to, to abuse those rules. So you want, you want to make sure that um, this is, is open, it's fair, it's something that regular members of the chapter can participate in. It's not siloed or, or, or gate kept in some way. It's something that, that is clear and on paper and everyone has a, a stake in uh, as long as they're a member of the organization. Another thing is that you wanna draw red lines in advance. Uh, you know, in politics, red lines are sort of iffy, you know, like we, we've had people in the past that were like, you know, oh, I don't wanna apply for the DSA endorsement because I know you all just have a bunch of litmus tests, but like litmus tests are good actually. Like, you know, like, you know, if, we, if you, if you, if you, if you want a candidate that, you know, um, doesn't take money from real estate developers, um, you know, don't, don't just, you know, allow anyone to come in the door who, 
who might be willing to compromise on that kind of thing. Uh, because what's going to end up happening is they're going to take money from real estate developers. You're going to have to endorse them. And it's, it's two meetings instead of one. It's a whole. It's a whole thing. So yeah, just say in advance what you don't want candidates to do or what you do want them to do. So for example, if you want them to be open socialists, say beforehand, our criteria includes that you should be a socialist. Um, and then also you should probably, you know, post it online if possible. That way just, you know, uh, there was a question in the chat earlier about how often we have no votes. We don't really have no votes because we filter a lot of people out with the process itself. Uh, a lot of people know going in that they're not going to get the endorsement because they're not that kind of candidate. Um, and they're not going to bother with the time and effort it takes to go through a questionnaire and interview. You know, we've had people get part of the way through the process. And then the electoral committee is like, well, you know, this rant that you went on about why Bernie Sanders is a communist or whatever, like, you know, we're not going to endorse you. Those people usually don't uh, decide to pursue that at the chapter vote level, you know. Uh, and so that's, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the process itself as long as it's transparent and accountable, a lot of times that uh, filters out candidates who um, don't have our goals and values in mind, uh, so to speak. Uh, so on the next slide, we have sort of like a, a table, I think. Yeah, it's just a step-by-step -step process. Um, again, none of this is one size fits all. This is what we use. Um, maybe it makes more sense for you to reach out to candidates before. That's something we've done in the past. Um, maybe it makes sense for you to do these in a different order, you know, probably not vote before all the other stuff that would not make a lot of sense, but, uh, you get what I mean. Uh, so yeah, you know, the chapter has some sort of opening call, open call for, for requests. Um, the chapter members can introduce a, a resolution to a, endorse a candidate. Then, uh, you have Q and A sessions and then members actually debate and discuss the endorsement. Um, and, and, and the final step has to be um, a chapter decision, one that is made by really the whole chapter uh, in whatever way that is expressed. Um, some chapters do this through an all member vote, like you know, an open vote goes out to every single member of the chapter and you vote up or down. Other chapters just do it at a meeting specifically, like a general meeting of the chapter where anyone is, is, is duly notified, um, but that should be your end result. It should not be some unaccountable committee, you know, in, a, in, in, in other types of organizations like we alluded to before that aren't DSA and aren't socialist in nature. A lot of times the people who make the decisions have very little to do with the people who do the work on the ground and more to do with who funds the organization. Uh, but we're a member funded organization, we're a member run organization. So it should be the membership that makes the final decision. All right, so we have another discussion point here, and then I believe there was someone on stack for this section who was on stack. Yeah, Matthew, Matthew L, if you want to go, um, and if, yeah, you can address this discussion point um, or not. Yeah, apologies if I'm if I'm addressing the wrong thing. If so, please cut me off. No, no um, so I, I'm also involved with um, endorsements for. Um, for um, our rev our revolution East Bay, um, and we have a questionnaire. And one thing I really like that we did there is our questionnaire is a Google form, and all the questions are mandatory. And a lot of our not all, but a lot most of our questions are yes no questions, and like where you basically have to say yes or no on stuff. And so we've done that basically to force candidates to go on record. Like they literally can't complete the questionnaire without answering something like, "Do you support BDS?" or do you support a moratorium on, on deportations? Um, and so um, unless you want to do like what one candidate once did, which was the like painstakingly made a PDF of our questionnaire and tried to submit that so she could skip the BDS question, um, which we caught immediately. Um, but um, I found that that's really good because it forces people to go on the record. It's not perfect. You can't exactly do that with stuff. For instance, um, you know, do you support the funding, the police and redirecting it to social services? You know, they could say yes, but then turn out they're like, oh, yes, but only but cutting it by 1%. But in my, um, and we've also, you can do that for like, do you pledge not to take any money from the following sources and then like list landlords, et cetera, every, everything you want to include. include. I, I'm a big fan of doing that. I strongly advocate folks do that while also still having some questions that are long response stuff, because like, 
you still need to ask like some things like what's your, you know, maybe um, what is uh, being a socialist mean to you? That's from, that's from East Bay DSA's questionnaire, not our revolution East Bay's. Um, and I, and that's really good. But also depending on circumstances, sometimes those things like defunding the police, you may actually be able to do a clear yes, no question. Like there was a demand in Berkeley from community groups to specifically cut our police department immediately by 50%. And so we included that um, in 2020 as on our, for our revolution East Bay, as like for all the Berkeley candidates, do you support cutting the proposal to cut the police department by 50% immediately? Cause that was a specific thing where you could nail them on a yes, no. And they, so that's something I'd advocate for folks to do. I think, it's, I think it's a really great way to put people on record on certain things. And I'll just also say it's really great like seeing how many candidates, because more people go to Our Revolution East Bay than DSA. It's really great how many people we've been able to get like to say, yes, I support BDS. And then we have that on paper if like they ever try to do anything bad and we can just call them a liar. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to advocate for that. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really good point. I think um, we'll probably have to move on from this discussion point in the interest of time, but if folks can just add maybe some details about your chapter's questionnaire um, in the chat, you know, how long it is, do you have yes, no questions, are the questions required? I think that would be really great to see. Because um, when we were re redeveloping ours, um, I know folks in our chapter talked to, I think, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and New York, maybe, or maybe just Pittsburgh and New York, I can't remember. Um, but comparing and contrasting that was really, really helpful. Um, okay, I'll do this section pretty quickly, um, just because this is something we wanted to mention in terms of what does a transition from endorsement to actual campaigning look like? Um, you know, what does it look like in practice? Because it's easy to say, oh, we, we endorsed the candidate, we went through this great process, and it was democratic and transparent and accessible. We got tons of applications and then we settled on these, you know, two candidates. But what does it look like to actually move from that to picking things uh, into gear and getting, you know, hitting the, the streets, raising some money um, and getting folks elected? So here is, um, oh, there we go. Here are some things that we thought it was good to keep in mind. And it was, the reason we wanted to have this section in a, a training about endorsements is because the buy-in that you can achieve through your endorsement process will dictate your capacity level where you start the, the electoral campaign. Um, and that's something that we found time and time again, and cycle and cycle again in Metro DC is that if you use your endorsement process, not just to gauge your candidates and to strategically um, select who you think that your chapter can make the most material difference in electing, but also to hype the candidates. We call it revving up the hype machine. And if you can do that through your endorsement process, you will almost inevitably start with more of a sort of core committee or whatever you want to call it to support your chapter's candidates um, in that electoral cycle. And I always like to illustrate that sort of concept of, you know, slowly building throughout the campaign with this chart where you start endorsing the candidate, you have a, you know, a small number of volunteers you see here on the Y axis. And as the campaign progresses, you should have more and more volunteers. Sometimes it's a little bit slower than other times in terms of recruitment and you know, volunteer development and, and campaign cadre development. Um, but if you really hype up and really engage your chapter and build that buy-in throughout the endorsement process, you can sort of increase the number of chapter members who are then really committed to and who really want to get involved in that campaign. And that sort of investment is um, something that I personally remember developing from, you know, as for myself, getting involved in these campaigns. And it's really, really great to see the endorsement process bring out that level of investment, that level of sort of like passion and commitment um, to in, in fellow chapter members. Um, so yeah, this is just a, a couple of pictures for Metro DC. You can see there's 
photo illustrations of beginning of campaigns and then nearing the end of campaigns. Although this on the bottom row, Maryland just moved their their primary to July, so I guess they're not technically um, at the end of their campaign. Um, and yeah, we'll save the last discussion points for the very end, but um, if folks want to drop this discussion point in the chat as well, because um, I'd like to leave some time to, you know, at least five minutes or so at the end to discuss some of the political trade-offs that, that we probably all had to make in some way, shape, or form on endorsements. So just to read it out loud for folks, this discussion question is, what are some ways that DSA chapters could, could ease the transition? from endorsements to campaigning, or how have you done it? Um, all right. And then, Nick, I'll take us out, and then we'll open it up for discussion. Cool. So political trade-offs is definitely something we wanted to touch on. But like we said at the beginning of the training, this was not a training in how to navigate the political trade-offs of electoral endorsements, which I think themselves become almost political trade-offs of just electoral engagement in general. Um, but we definitely wanted to mention them and leave some space for discussion because it's always very interesting to see how um, folks in other chapters have dealt with these. So the first uh, trade-off we identified was timing. So we've mentioned here and there sort of like when to endorse um, or when to contact a candidate, when to make the candidates contact you. Um, I can say in, in Metro DC, we've settled kind of on early versus later endorsements, um, mostly because endorsing early uh, allows us to really set the, the tone and the stage for that cycle. And then we can signal to allied organizations um, and labor unions who we are going to be endorsing. So it will be a choice then for those um, other endorsing organizations. Oh, do, do we want to go up against, you know, 20, 30,000 doors that we know Metro DC is going to bring this cycle. Like, do we want, so we force them to make that calculation and we make our own sort of calculation about the district and who we think will jump in and endorse and who we don't. Um, red lines, Nick, Nick already kind of went over red lines a bit, so I won't um, touch on that too much, but um, they, they really will depend on the conditions of the race. And I think the more that we are able to develop electoral programs in DSA and in chapters, and the more that we're able to build those, that capacity in chapters, the more we're able, able to sort of raise the standards of our endorsement. So we have a lot of questions on our questionnaire in DC. And if you opened up that um, endorsement hand, handbook, you can find links to the questionnaire in there where you know there are there's BDS questions and there's questions about the police and, I've heard from other folks in other chapters, they say, oh, wow, this is great. You have these questions in there. And we got to those questions because we have consistently sort of put, um, we, we have been consistently put up the support numbers for candidates uh, in the past. And it's based, it's predictable that we're, we're able to do the same. So we're able to make those asks um, of candidates. And even if they're not asks at the outset, we're able to hold that line. Um, later on. And then um, running to win versus sort of awareness campaigns. Um, running to win is always an ideal situation, but awareness campaigns, you know, just kind of jumping in and saying, we want to engage our members. We want to activate our members. We want to mobilize our members. If you've never run an electoral campaign before, and I know we heard from a comment earlier who said that there aren't a lot of socialists maybe in their area or, um, you know, candidates aren't really interested yet in a, in a DSA endorsement in your area, then sometimes it, it can pay off to run for a chapter member to run for the chapter to get really involved and to build that capacity and to sort of learn the technical ropes and skills of electoral campaigning. Because then you will either have, you can do better next time with another chapter, you know, cadre candidate or somebody else who is maybe who has been in elected office before will come to your chapter and say, hey, I want to run for something else. I've been a DSA member for a year. I've considered myself a socialist. Um, what you did last cycle was really impressive. I want it, but let, let's do this. And that can happen sometimes too. We've had that happen where the candidate didn't actually win, but then stayed super involved in the chapter and in sort of more DSA aligned causes in the area. 
after the election was over, which is really great to see. Um, and yeah, with that, I will leave it on our last discussion point. We'll take um, some stacks. I see some stacks in the chat. Um, I know Sky, we didn't get to you before, so I'll take you first in this discussion point. And I I'm happy to stay on until nine, you know, for the next 15 minutes or so until we exhaust stack. Um, but yeah, this will be, I believe, the last slide. Yep, the last slide is just uh, just Ryan and Nick's contact information. So I will stay on. Um, Nick, I don't want to pressure you either, but um, if um, yeah, if we want to open it up for stack, Sky, go for it. Is Sky still there? Does not look like it. All right. Um, I mean, does anybody else want to get on stack and talk about, you know, political trade-offs that you've had to make in your chapter? Um, could be through the endorsement process. It could be in general. Um, otherwise, I'm gonna Nick. I'm gonna pick on you to talk about more more political. Uh, oh, Devin. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Hey, how's it going? Um, hey. Yeah. So in our chapter, um, we made an endorsement and the guy was given like a hundred thousand dollars um, by a charter school association. And we had a vote to rescind the endorsement. And uh, there's a lot of drama around it. And uh, but yeah, beforehand, we didn't establish really any hard red lines or we don't have like a handbook or anything like that it was just kind of like a q a so yeah. i think that's what we're trying to build towards like next time but i was wondering like if you had any advice for like the stage we're at right now yeah i mean my best advice for those situations is to add a question to your questionnaire that says will you reject like if, if we endorse you will you commit to rejecting endorsements from xyz organizations um, I know for a fact that the teachers union in our area in, in DC has a question that says, will you reject, uh, they did at least at one point last cycle, they had a question that said, will you reject like the local charter school billionaire funded lobbyist group? Um, and we have, I think, a question that says, will you reject um, any sort of police endorsement effectively? So a labor union that's prim primarily police oriented or what have you, um, so I think FOP or something like that. And at first people were a little bit hesitant about putting that on a questionnaire, but then um, they weren't because candidates would just say, okay, yeah, I'm cool with it. Um, if they did the kind of, I see what you did last time around and let's go, I'm ready for this. Um, so yeah, I think it, it, part of it's just having the confidence as a chapter to say like, no, this is this is going to be a red line. We've gotten, you know, we've experienced fallout from this in the past, and it's either going to be you as a candidate vote or say yes to this, or we got a whole bunch of other stuff we could do this cycle. Um, have a good day and good luck. Nick, did, did I see your hand up for a second there? Yeah, I just wanted to add, I think one important thing that you can do in your chapter is sort of you know, do, do a form of power mapping where you can kind of see who the local players are um, that sort of try to buy your local political class. Um, you know, for example, uh, we don't have a red line in our questionnaire about charter school funding because there's not really, there are charter schools in Kentucky. We don't really have, that, that's not a thing that's ever come up before. Obviously, we would, we would in the same situation unendorse a candidate that took $100,000 for charter schools, no question. But, uh, you know, we do ask whether or not they oppose charter schools. Um, but we do have specific pledges along, say, real estate developers, right? That's a big one for us. We always try to get our candidates to sign the Homes Guarantee Pledge. Um, they always have. Um, and specifically, the reason for that is that the, 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 the politics in the city are largely dictated by the developer class. Um, and so, you know, you can you can sort of map out who the big normal donors are um, by going through. Well, I don't know how every state does this, but in Kentucky, you can just go through and read. I think it's every state where you, you can read who's donating to what campaigns. I think that's a, a feature that everyone's going to have. 
And so, um, yeah, you need to you need to have a good sense of who's playing in the local elections, who's going to be likely trying to buy a candidate that um, might be socialism curious or or even a DSA member, um, and 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 put that red line in there first so that you don't deal with situations like that. But it's um, it's one of the most common issues I feel like for chapters is uh, it's always either a real estate developer or a charter school company or a police union. Uh, it's always the same kind of interests in, in most places that do that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, like I put in the chat, I feel like these debates have played out across the country in DSA chapters in one way or another. Um, and we we've all sort of developed our own strategies to to work through the debates, to navigate through them, to prevent them from happening again. Um, not preventing the debates, but from uh, preventing sort of like a candidate taking a, a charter school endorsement or whatever, charter lobby endorsement. And it's, it's tough because you never think that, that they're gonna actually do that until they do. And then, and then you're like, well, yeah, I guess we should have said something, but it's kind of like, well, maybe they should have not. But that's why every cycle you sort of try to create those standards and then just become a little bit better every cycle. And it's it's not like you were we were bad before. We're kind of starting from scratch. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thanks, thanks, Nick, for sharing that. Thank you for the question too. It was a really good question. Um, Matthew L, I think you're the only one on stack at this point. That should take us out. Okay, if I'm the only one on stack, I'll go again. Um, yeah, I'll say like one political trade off we've had in our chapter, which again is East Bay DSA. And so we're one of the larger chapters, largest chapters, and this is a good problem to have is um, sometimes we have like more candidates who like um coming to us for endorsements who are who are legitimately like people that like you know our class struggle election or can, um class can be like um and like you know are politically like politically you know they're viable and they're politically like aligned with us um uh, but like we have too many people coming to us and we have to make and like we can't necessarily meaning we can't really meaningfully intervene in all of them particularly if we uh, if we want to basically have us be the you know have them hold, uh, super accountable to us in um particularly um and so one way that we're considering doing with that is well we're having our our our, our annual convention um on sunday and we uh, we've uh, written a proposal uh, there's a proposal for us to basically do kind of like a second tier of like a lo second lower tier of endorsements where we basic so that we avoid what we did last time where like we endorsed in 12 campaign and the, and the, and then like kind of um 12 or, th or maybe it was 16 I, I think it was 12 and like we split like all our resources equally and didn't make much of a big impact in any of them and then like we'd have the second we'd have like a lower tier where there's not a guaranteed level of minimum resources and we could still kind of support candidates who kind of are running class struggle campaigns but um direct but focus all of our resources into a smaller number of them and now maybe that's maybe that's not a good strategy maybe it actually or maybe it's a really great strategy uh strategy um but that's something that we're considering in our chapter and we're going to take uh, we're going to uh, we're going to vote on whether or not to adopt that on sunday yeah that's i think that's an excellent idea um we we dealt with that this time around i think i put it in the chat uh that we had 11 11 or 12 candidates uh request endorsement and we said no to seven or eight we eventually ended up four um and in addition to um, you know, really looking at our chapter as having sort of a pool of resources, and I kind of alluded to at the beginning of the training, and those resources being your know, time as our as our primary resource, a you know, small dollar fundraiser or fundraising, um, and seeing it that way, people really looked at it like, oh, we can't split everything up. What we also did is we had this committee. Uh, and one of their roles, in addition to the political engagement committee, in addition to um, helping to coordinate and facilitate the endorsement process in our chapter, they also write a report where they, they write a report about who they think the chapter can feasibly endorse and who the chapter should endorse. Now, the general body doesn't have to 
vote for that, those recommendations one way or the other. But um, we tried that this year, and I think it worked really, really well, just in terms of saying, hey, here are the candidates that we think have a shot, and here is where we think our chapter is capacity-wise, um, and this is why we think we should endorse you know, candidates X, Y, and Z, in that these candidates will also have, like, like I said, have a shot. You know, every door knocked will be a chance that that door takes them over the finish line. So that was really helpful as well. Um, yeah, next slide, sorry. Yeah, uh, we, we, we did some tiered endorsements a few years ago. That was part of our electoral strategy. It was good. It was very good in terms of being able to allocate our resources. Uh, we ended up moving away from it because, to be completely honest, there aren't people knocking down the door to run as a socialist in Kentucky. Uh, that, you know, that is a unique local condition uh, 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 that's going to vary from chapter to chapter. I, I'm very sympathetic, though, to, to you know, our larger, our larger chapters and more left-leaning areas with, 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 with maybe stronger uh, bases for socialism. Uh, and specifically in the East Bay, you all have the Richmond Progressive Alliance, which can produce large amounts of candidates with class struggle orientations. That we, we don't have anything like that here. Um, so yeah, I think I think that's definitely going to vary based on your chapter needs. But it's definitely an idea that we've experimented with in the past that had some benefits. Uh, one thing that I would say is that uh, when I hear something like that, one recommendation I would have is to be making strategic decisions earlier in the cycle about which races and which districts you want to target. So you can sit down, you know, in an off year when you're not having an election and really drill down into, you know, precinct by precinct analysis from previous elections, maybe having an understanding of where your members are, maybe having an understanding of who was very responsive around some priority campaign that you had and saying, hey, you know, here in District 15, we've got a bunch of members, we've got a bunch of people that were involved in this campaign that we did, they really don't like the incumbent. What if we get, you know, what if we prioritize this in the next cycle? Um, and then that opens up a lot of things. Not only does that raise your understanding of whether or not to endorse that candidate when they come to you, but also gives you the opportunity to maybe be on the front end of recruiting and training and making sure that candidate is, you know, DSA cadre and, 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 and ensuring that you have someone who is, who is really with the cause and not just someone that's coming to ask for the endorsement who might be a good candidate. Um, but, but, you know, is, you know, you know, maybe, maybe instead of uh, a good candidate coming to ask for Matthew's endorsement, Matthew is running, you know, that's the kind of thing, uh, that, that a chapter can do. So, uh, that, that is one recommendation I would probably point an electoral committee towards. Uh, but it's definitely, it's not something you're gonna wanna do in the first cycle probably because you're gonna need to gather information to do that kind of analysis correctly. But eventually you're gonna get there. All right. Um, yeah, thanks. That I, I would not have added anything else about peers. We, we also sort of discuss it every cycle um and eventually we we agree with moving away from tiers just because in in metro dc we try to focus all of our resources on just a very very small amount of races instead of trying to tier because the issue with tiers too is that if you tell a candidate or a campaign like oh yeah you are you know second tier and they agree to it in the beginning of the election um what happens sometimes is towards the end of the election when it gets to be crunch time then everyone starts starts making phone calls to the chapter's electoral committee chair, and they're, they're asking, "Okay, where's the, I know I'm second tier, but where's my canvas? You know, it's really close to some of the wire." Um, so you you might run into that, even though you do have those conversations early. Um, all right, um, it is nine twenty. Thanks, folks, for sticking around and talking about this stuff. Sorry, we went over a little bit. Um, I don't really have anything else to. To add nick are you good i'm good okay cool well thanks everybody for coming out i'm gonna stop the recording um yeah and you can see our email addresses here on the screen uh and our uh, i believe twitter handles feel free to get in touch with at least me and nick i don't want to speak for you but you seem like <laughs> a pretty amenable guy um yeah thanks all 
uh, I just stopped the record. I'll stop the recording now.